algorithm and that hash algorithm produced hash data will be merged will be combined using xor operation and then those xor values will further combine and then in hierarchically it will create a single digest value and this digest value will be encrypted with the sender's private key and transmitted to the receiver so if i talk about the verification process now when verification process started then receiver will first of all check the uh, will, will decrypt the final xor value that is known as our final digest and then it will compare it with the received digest value if the final xor value matches if this final xor value matched that means nothing is nothing change has happened in this file so this document is verified but in any how if this particular final xor is not matched then receiver will perform the top down tree matching of all the xor values to check which particular digest has modification suppose uh, xor final is not matched then it will check xor array 10 xor value and subsequently it will move down the line and it will perform xor array 0 and xor array 1 to compare which one is not matched with the received one then it will suppose xor array 0 is not matched then it will again go down the line and check either d1 or d2 is not matched say d2 is not matched in that case this particular portion of the data in this xml file got corrupted so this particular portion need to be check again otherwise what uh, receiver was doing receiver was simply rejecting the complete file but in this case we are not rejecting the complete file we may ask for a particular portion of information again from the sender only so this is the basic uh, uh, block diagram that we are following that xml file is divided into sub documents and then it will be hashed by using hash function then we will use hierarchical xor of all the values and then we will encrypt this with the private key of sender and this digital signature is produced if we talk about the verification of this multi signature we have created so in this case this again receiver receives a xml file signed by the sender and it will again perform the same procedure that was performed by the sender and it will create hash values for each sub document then it will perform the xor and then create the final digest if the final digest value matches with the received one then that means it is verified if it is not matched then we can say then receiver has to localize the error so we i have implemented all the concept with the help of python programming and uh, these are the certain results that i have uh, analyzed so first of all uh, in this case uh, if i am using these four hash algorithms sha224256 up till sha512 i can analyze that any of the algorithm i can use to create the digest value depending upon its uh, you know usability and for this particular analysis i have used a xml file of size 500 kb data in which i have analyzed that this that the time required for uh, digest creation as well as verification of the file is almost overlapping so in this concludes that i can use any of the hash algorithm so and also i have written that this is without error that means i am not uh, uh, expecting uh, i have not uh, include any error in the file or any modification then the creation and verification time is displayed next is suppose one error or one or two or more uh, digest values got corrupted then this uh, uh, 
result obtained is again overlapping with the without error curve that means kalla session wari aa jayegi 7a wari 7c wari that this particular uh, chain detection technique has not uh, causing any extra overhead next is time required for creating digest values only if i talk about i am creating say 64 digest values on a xml document then is it going to create mr jati um, yes ma'am you have last two minutes please conclude your presentation yes yes ma'am so these are the uh, graphical results in which uh, i have used multiple files uh, of different sizes to analyze the results that shows if file size increases then the time required to create digest also increases but if i talk about creating xor values then xor values are not uh, uh, causing any extra overhead on the digest algorithm so similarly if i talk about creating only xor then if the number of xor values need to combine more then it will take lot of uh, not much time but yes it is uh, observable so in the uh, conclusion i want to say that this uh, proposed algorithm achieve a time complexity of order of log n but if i compare my entire xml document one by one then it is of very you know say order of n square or order of n log n complexity was there but we have reduced it to order of log n so this is the major uh, achievement by using this strategy of multiple digest scheme so next are the references am i audible uh, yes, yes ma'am yes ma'am you are okay. audible uh first of all your flow presentation uh, was very good like i yes thank you ma'am i have just uh, two doubts the first one uh, the first one is uh, like you are going to divide the whole file into the uh, different different uh, I, uh, i think digest a uh, sub the individual uh, part of that file which you have yes. ha sub document let's say yes. that as a sub document so what should be the ideal size of that particular uh, document ka matlab have you done any experimentation ki uh, because uh, each and every xml document will vary in size and you matlab is there any standard size ki the given document should be divided uh, into this size then only my matlab uh, your algorithm works better or if it exceeds than this size then there will be problem if it is lesser than this size then there will be problem so will you uh, comment on this particular uh, part yes ma'am yes ma'am there are uh, multiple uh, parameters on which we can decide like uh, we can decide on the basis of size like if my file is 5 100 kb then i can divide into 50 50 kb size files or my next criteria is i can divide my file according to number of records in each sub document so ma'am uh, i have divided my file according to the number of records in each sub document so but i have opted a strategy suppose in my xml file i have 1000 records then i am creating number of digest on the basis of 50 uh, uh, 50 records in each sub document so i have decided i will divide the sub document based upon the number of records in each sub document so okay uh, sub document this many number of uh, am i audible yes uh, ma'am you are audible yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, can we can can we have uh, ma'am uh, ma your voice is not audible yes ma your voice is ma'am very creaky okay acha lubi please repeat your question ma'am yes ma yeah i just uh, now am i audible yes, yes ma'am ma you are perfectly audible can you hear yes okay ma okay yes ma okay so i 
going to uh, make the division based on the number of records so yeah. how many numbers would be there in one sub document like uh, uh, what what number of sub records you have uh, what number of records you have considered in one uh, sub document uh, yes ma'am for your experimentation purpose uh, yes ma'am ma'am first of all i am uh, considering i first of all i have calculated the uh, number of records in the xml uh, document and then sender has a choice that how many sub documents he wants to create if the number of uh, digest okay values increases then ultimately the time required to create those digest values also get increased so sender can decide that how many digest values it can use okay okay okay, okay thank you uh last last question uh, is there any limitation of your proposed method like uh, do you find any limitation uh yes ma'am i found one limitation that uh, if i use uh, more than 100 digest values then the time required to create digest is uh, very very observable and noticeable and it creates uh, delay okay 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 uh thank you jatin uh, it was a nice session all the best for your future work thank you ma'am can we consider now the second presentation uh, thank you ma'am thank you all yes the second presentation is implementation of optimized vlsi architecture by aro ms amrita ji am i audible ma'am yes yes you are okay. yes you are audible yes a uh, good evening everyone hello ma'am am i audible yes sir okay. yes sir please start good your evening, good evening everyone uh, here i am to going to present uh, my topic that is uh, implementation of vlsi architecture for uh, montgomery modular multiplier uh, my name is saran thomas i am currently pursuing my mdec degree in amrutha university uh, my paper id is 303 here are the contents of my uh presentation uh, then we will move to the introduction part and the problem definition here are the pop, uh, problem definition that is the montgomery modular multiplication uh, is basically used uh, algorithm that is used uh, in arun mr arun uh, yes ma'am your voice is quite creaky please oh, okay. please Hello? tap your headphones or microphone uh, am i audible now yes okay uh, the main aim of this paper is to study the potential gains of montgomery algorithm uh, compared to the classic ones such as uh, rsa etc that type of uh, algorithms and uh, here i implemented uh, it in hardware implementation uh, here i particularly used uh, the montgomery algorithm is main uh, is uh, used by some carry save adder instead of some carry save adder i replaced the carry save adder with some uh, carry select adder carry skip adder and some other types of adder and i compared uh, that adder with the area and the power dissipation here are the introduction part uh that is the increase in use of internet and electronic era has brought uh, some secrecy and some security uh, in electronic communication uh, so we have to check the security uh, day by day uh, so we have to use some cryptography method uh, for uh, provide to provide some secure communication uh, for its hardware implementation uh, this type of uh, montgomery modular multiplication algorithm is used widely it is used in public key crypto system here uh, it is a just introduction of montgomery modular multiplication 
uh, is basically used in some type of cryptographic algorithms and in some digital signal processing application. Uh, here in this topic, my main objective is to reduce the delay of the algorithm calculation and to reduce the area by uh, minimizing the multipliers, uh, adders and some type of operations uh, by reducing low hardware complexity. Uh, to speed up the high, uh, to speed up the Montgomery multiplication algorithm, uh, we have to uh, employ some um, uh, good quality uh, adders like adhesive adder. Here I uh, replaced it with some type of other adders and I just compared it with the areas and delay. Uh, then it is widely used for the method of performing fast modular multiplication and it is mainly used in public, uh, pub public key crypto systems. Uh, here the main, uh, uh, the main objective and the main usage of this multiplication is that it will be uh, it will replace the division operation by a shift operation and it will reduce the delay of each operation. Here the Montgomery algorithm adds multiples of modulus to clear these bits before shifting them out. Widely, uh, the Montgomery multiplication algorithm is classified into such as full carry save Montgomery modular multiplication and semi carry save Montgomery modular multiplication. In full carry save Montgomery modular multiplication, both the obtained sum and the carry is considered as output, but in semi carry save Montgomery modular multiplication algorithm only the sum is considered as output and the intermediate result the carry is considered uh, will not be considered as the output it is the major uh, advantage of semi carry save Montgomery modular multiplier instead of full carry save Montgomery multiplication. In semi carry save Montgomery modular multiplication the input and output operands of the Montgomery multiplication as represented in the binary. Here, uh, the intermediate result are kept in carry save format. Uh, the main advantage of keeping uh, the intermediate result as um, intermediate result uh, in carry save format is to avoid the propagation and thereby re reducing the delay of the each operation. Uh, and the format conversion from the carry save format to the final product uh, into its binary representation, we need an additional uh, multiplier at the end of the uh, output. Here are the example of one Montgomery modular multiplication. This, this is a typical example such that it will be uh, uh, here X and Y are some uh, type of um, variable uh, that I used for some example. It will be first added together and then it will be added with the intermediate result and we will check it with, uh, we will check the output that the last bit is whether zero or not. It will be continued until uh, the final output uh, is less than the intermediate result. Here are the typical example uh, in case of binary uh, and decimal. Uh, first I choose the x is equal to two, y is equal to five and n is equal to seven. The same is, uh, the same binary operation I have done in the right side. Uh, in the first loop, uh, it will be added with the zero and five. Then it will check whether the P of zero, that is the last bit is whether is one or not. Then it will be added with the uh, intermediate, that is modulus value. Then it will be divided by two, that will we get six. And in the second loop, we will get added with the six and then it will add it with the next uh, next binary value, that is five. And then it is, uh, again, it will check for the last uh, last digit that is either it is one or zero, mm, then it is divided by two. Then we will get the uh, final output as one. Then we will check it with the modulus value n. If the final output that is nine is greater than n, then we will uh, subtract the nine from the modulus value and the, we will get the final Montgomery algorithm output as two. The main advantage of SCS based uh, Montgomery multiplication over the conventional multiplication is that the subtractor is avoided. Uh, so we, is, uh, we here is used a semi carry save adder uh, in uh, that is in uh, due to this uh, area of summation that we can be calculated done and the power dissipation is also reduces with the reduction in overall delay. Here is the first uh, method I used that I used a carry save adder. 
here a carry save adder is typically used in binary multiplier and it is a easily available adder it involves uh, two type of uh, it involves uh, the addition of addition of more than two binary numbers uh, the main advantage of this type of adder is that the carry will not be propagated through each stages instead of uh, instead of uh, propagating the carry it will be stored in a present stage and it will add an as a add and value in the next stage hence we can reduce the delay and the carry is reduced the, this is the typical output RTL image after the execution and here is the output I got uh, by using carry save adder uh, instead of some carry save adder I replaced uh, it with a carry select adder in carry select adder it will consist of a two ripple carry adder uh, the main advantage uh, is that uh, the result are calculated with the output sum and the carry selected with a multiplier by using the correct carry that is we can reduce we can further reduce the delay by using the carry select adder this is the output form that i got uh, after the execution execution of carry select adder this is the third adder i used instead of carry save adder here is the carry skip adder uh, mr thomas uh, yes sir mr. Thomas, you have last two minutes please conclude your presentation okay sure uh, this is um, this is the final adder I used. Uh, the main advantage is further is that we can further reduce the delay. That is the each propagate bit that is provided by the carry ripple chain. It will be connected into AND gate and AND gate will directly send it to the output value. This is the output image that I used after uh, using the carry skip adder. This is the conclusion, conclusion and comparison table. The proposed Montgomery multiplier can achieve higher performance and higher speed. The delay and area, the power of the multiplier can be further reduced. The efficiency of the multiplier is improved by replacing the carry save with carry select and the carry skip adder. We can um, we can see that uh, by using um, by using the carry uh, carry select adder in case of carry save, we can further reduce the delay and the power in carry select adder compared to the carry save adder and the utilization percentage is also the component utilization percentage also reduces from the 7% to the uh, 4 7% uh, uh, and in carry select adder is 4% uh, this is a further calculation by using carry skip adder. This carry skip adder by using the carry skip adder, uh, the LU, um, the reduction is uh, the reduction in LUTs from uh, carry select that is carry select use 63 and the carry skip is uh, 59. This shows the further reduction in area and it will increase the performance. These are the reference. And thank you. Arun, am I audible to you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Huh. Uh, very nice presentation again. Uh, I just have one question uh, related to the uh, memory perspective. Like carry save adder may uh, every time uh, instead of uh, doing the calculation, you are saving the carry, right? So from the memory perspective, I just want you to compare these three methods, carry save adder, carry select adder, and carry skip adder. And nice, performance wise, which, which is better? Uh, will, you, will you please uh, put your review, uh, view on this particular aspect? Yes, ma'am. The carry skip adder, the carry skip adder gives the redu uh, reduction uh, in area uh, because the component utilized by the uh, carry skip uh, by the carry skip adder is reduced to much more than the carry save and carry select adder. Uh, performance wise, you mean to say carry skip adder gives uh, it's the better uh, way to implement it, right? Yes, ma'am. The area and the uh, whatever the, the experimentation area. which you carried out based on that, you can conclude that carry skip adder is better than the previous two methods. Yes, ma'am. And memory also, it doesn't require, there is no such, uh, as such memory requirement for the carry skip adder. Ma'am, I, I just relay the delay and power efficiency uh, by using uh, delay, okay. power efficiency and area, that's it. Okay, okay. Uh, one last question, uh, like whatever the method which you implemented for the yes, security, uh, it's a hardware approach which you have used. So will yes, you just uh, tell the advantage of this hardware security approach over the software security approaches? Ma'am, uh, I didn't get. What you. would be the 
what would be the advantage of uh, your implementation like uh, security related aspects you have uh, considered uh, okay. here okay ma'am okay ma'am okay, ma so, ma so, so what would be the advantage of implementing uh, hardware oriented uh, security aspect like this whatever you have implemented okay ma'am uh, ma'am basically this my Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, basically, uh, this algorithm is used in uh, public uh, public key cr uh, crypto systems. That in uh, first, the uh, transmitter send uh, will send a coded message, and the receiver will get the coded message, and it will decrypt. And the receiver needs this algorithm uh, for decrypt uh, the uh, the message sent by the transmitter. Uh, so while decrypting, we have to uh, reduce the decrypting time. and we have to reduce the uh, software complexity and hardware complexity by the uh, receiver so i just increased the um, time that the, uh, i increased the performance by reducing the delay uh, delay of the uh, decryption ma'am yes yes understood understood okay. uh, thank you varun uh, ma'am shall we go for the next presentation uh, it's artificial yes. intelligence healthcare performance ma uh thank you uh by soumya so yes okay soumya soumya roy soumya roy is here uh yes ma'am should i share my presentation Yes, yes, yes. Please start your presentation. Okay, is it visible? Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Somya Roy. I am a student of B Tech IT from Amit University, Noida, and. the topic for my research and presentation is artificial intelligence in healthcare and i will be presenting today on behalf of my co-authors arjuna singh and chetna chaudhary so uh, uh let's start with the introduction so as we all know information in healthcare is growing at a speed at which the human mind cannot really keep it in one distinct view or frame so we need the power of machine but it's the hybrid of humans and machine together that make it more powerful artificial intelligence targets the targets to imitate human cognitive functions it has been playing a powerful and growing job in the past few decades signing into your social media email car ride services and online shopping platforms all include artificial intelligence algorithms to improve the user experience the search of ai started more than 80 years ago the idea was that computer technology in the future would be powerful enough to carry out tasks better and more efficiently than human so one significant zone where ai is growing rapidly is the medical field ai can be applied to countless types of healthcare data some of the current ai applications include uh, early detection medical diagnosis drug discovery medical image analysis ai assisted ro robotic surgery and so on cancer neurology and cardiology are some of the major disease areas that use ai tools so in the image we can see that uh, we can see the uh, the expected benefits that we can get from ai and ml uh, the most chronic health conditions uh, that can be that can benefit from ai are diabetes heart disease cancer neurological diseases and infectious diseases so uh, here is the literature review uh let's have a brief look at the previous work that has been done for this field there are various studies signifying that ai can perform just as or better than people uh, at key healthcare tasks such as diagnosing diseases uh, remarkable qualitative and quantitative work has been done on artificial intelligence in healthcare Uh, and can be found in the literature so raju vaishya discusses the application of ai for covid-19 pandemic where they gave seven significant applications of ai in the pandemic while discussing the role in detecting the cluster of cases and predicting where this virus will affect in future by collecting and, and analyzing all previous all previous data 
and uh, now let's get to the applications of AI in healthcare. The first one is predictive AI software. So uh, powerful computers are accurately predicting the number of patients that will arrive in the emergency department two days in advance. The predictions come from software processing real-time data on admissions, wait time, transfers and discharges stretching back over a year. Pathology, dermatology and radiology departments will likely be the first to see the major changes. The software does its prediction basically by finding patterns and pinpointing the bottlenecks, how long it takes a doctor to see the patient, how long the patients are waiting for their bed to be clean. If you can somehow shorten each one, a lot of time and money will be saved. The next application uh, would be assessing glucose levels. So uh, an AI system that detects low glucose level has been put out by, by a research team. This is done by electrocardiogram. This approach removed the requirement for blood tests. It is effective for the detection of diabetes. The electrocardiogram uh, readout is acquired from a wearable sensor. From the trials, the approach seems to have an 82% reliability rate and the potential is there to eliminate the invasive finger pick test. Next application would be chatbots and other AI driven healthcare apps. Chatbots powered by AI can have a transformative potential in healthcare. They could deliver personalized or timed reminders for medications, appointments and more. Patients could also speak to a chatbot by describing their symptoms and have their case elevated to a real doctor based on the analysis and emergency if the diagnosis turns out to be more serious or requires the attention of a professional. It can help in minimizing the patient uh, a trip to the doctor by providing care instructions for minor issues. And there are many apps that we can find uh, that, uh, that collect patient symptoms and then provides a diagnosis. To do this, they compare millions of data points from other patients and research papers and give information on possible issues and offer treatment and advice. Uh, next application would be social media. So there is an AI that can tell that a person is depressed based on what they post on their social media. Uh, so basically how they do this is by looking at their photos and the filters that they have used. The study has used color analysis and algorithmic face detection by gathering data from 43,000 photos posted by 166 people to identify the indicators of depression in each participant. The result was able to predict which person had been diagnosed with depression 70% of the time. According to the experiment, usually bluer, grayer, and darker tones are favored by depressed individuals, uh, and the filters are Inquil and Crema filters being the most used ones. Mental, mentally healthy individuals, in comparison, usually tend towards brighter end with uh, it, like Valencia filter being the most healthy filter. So, uh, so the future of AI in healthcare. Now, there are many uh, ways in which AI can improve in the future. So, one of those would be using doc use using AI for doctor's clinical paperwork. The relationship between the doctor and patient is the establishing principle of healthcare and medicine. So doctors can spend up the double amount of time on paperwork than in the patients. So if that time is reduced, they can focus more on the patients than on the paperwork. Next is to use machines to reduce errors. The problem with efficiency and accuracy can be solved using AI. And powerful machines can scan 150 times more rapidly and are able to function 24 hours a day. Again, this would reduce the time on the uh, non-patient work and the doctor can focus more on the patient. Treat patients at home and not hospital. Monitoring patients in, in the security and comfort of their own home because sensors that would deliver the equal monitoring as if someone was in the intensive unit care. So this would help in preventing hospital-acquired diseases and also save money. So one of the main concerns in any kind of medical procedure is patient safety. Using AI in healthcare raises some important safety questions that must be considered and taken seriously. Other than that, there are a list of disadvantages that come along with new technologies. The first one in this case being a lack of personal involvement. 
So one of the most important part of healthcare is building trust between a doctor and patient. Surgery boards, on the other hand, are not programmed to feel any compassion and sympathy towards the patients and are completely logical. So this can be viewed as a disadvantage. The next would be a rise in unemployment and among healthcare workers. Uh, many activities usually completed by humans can be done by machines nowadays. This can result in a huge increase in unemployment rate. Then we have insensitivity to impact. AI doesn't yet have the capability to consider false negatives or false positives. Next is unsafe failure mode, exceptions and privacy concerns. Soumya. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, you have last one minute. Please try to close okay, okay. yes, your yes, presentation yes. on time. So, uh, uh, I would like to conclude now. So, to conclude this presentation, I would like to say that the heart of medicine is human interaction and trust. Finding the balance can be a challenge. So, anything involving big data, profit-driven companies and healthcare should be heavily regulated and AI won't necessarily serve anyone fairly. AI has proven to be extremely significant in healthcare, providing implements that have been beneficial where humans previously uh, lacked, yet its potential is not fully discovered yet. So, that's all. Here's the references. Thanks. <coughs> okay. So, may I, uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you have done a, a literature survey on this, uh, how artificial intelligence can be used for the healthcare performance, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what do you think, uh, what is the major area of the healthcare where nowadays uh, mostly the AI is usable and uh, will you comment ki which is the area where uh, AI won't be more applicable? Like you okay. have given many applications of uh, AI yes, in healthcare. Yes, ma'am. So out of that, uh, which one, according to your study, you find it, AI would be most uh, favorable uh, technology there in that particular domain? And, yes, uh, ma'am. Domain where you cannot uh, replace human uh, with the artificial intelligence techniques. And there are lots of drawbacks in that. Yes. Really? So personally, I think uh, the area where AI can be very beneficial is things like disease diagnosis, even COVID, where there is image processing and the AI can help in processing those images and doing diagnosis. But uh, the area where I think AI yet cannot help much is, uh, I would say, mental health, because mental health is more about, you know, compassion and empathy that a therapist shows. Uh, the AI really cannot show those feelings as it is a bot, basically. So I think that would be a drawback. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Somia. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay. So, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Shall we start with the uh, next presentation? Enhancing yes, yes, yes. security of cloud platform with cloud access security. So, okay. Uh, huh, Shah Nawaz is there. Yes, ma'am. Shah Nawaz is here. Am I audible now? Yes. 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 Can you share my screen? Yes, Not you yet. Can. Not yet. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Sorry? Is the skin visible? No, no, your screen. It is. Yeah, now it's visible. Okay. So, uh, so my name is Shana Wazeman. I'm a PhD scholar from Jamia Mli Islami University. Today I'm going to present my research paper and the title of my research paper is Enhancing Security of Cloud Platform with Cloud Access Security Broker. These are the table of content which I have to cover in this presentation. Introduction, mind map, cloud access security broker, what are the objectives, proposed methodology, conclusion, future work, and the references. Let's come to the introduction. First, I, I will let you know about the cloud computing. Cloud computing, the on-demand delivery of compute power, database, storage applications, and other IT resources through a cloud service platform and internet with pay-as-you-go pricing model. So we can classify cloud com computing in two categories based on cloud location and based on cloud services. Cloud hosts software detects as a control point to support continuous visibility, compliance, threat protection, and security for cloud services. 
This is a diagram of a uh, classification of cloud computing, which I have covered in the previous slide. Based on our literature review, we have identified those use cases for the enterprises that have been proposed to strengthen the cloud computing security, such as uh, secure shadow ID, governed device uses, secure data, and block malware. But they do not provide any insight into generation of ideas using mindmap and how to adjust a stakeholder into suitable colloquium in a practical manner. Therefore, the purpose of this paper is to recommend a goal-oriented security issues mind map generation method for cloud computing security with the help of cloud access security broker support. So first we we'll let you know about cloud or mind map. What is actually the mind map is? Mind map is an intelligent tool which uh, imitates how information is stored in the brain this tool can assist stakeholders to understand the security gaps. MindMap is an active method of articulating separate ideas along with its association in systematized way. In almost daily life situations, such as writing notes and writing down a list of words, MindMap can be used. Nowadays, several individual and enterprises how use mind map in picturizing, uh, picturizing programming for problem solving skills, planning, note taking, brainstorming, analysis, generating ideas, decision making, and presentation. So, this will be the motivation by using mind map with and or graph. Let's come to the next slide that is Cloud Access Security Broker. So, Cloud Access Security Broker. Uh, is a set of new cloud security technologies that addresses the challenges posed by the user, posed by the use of cloud applications and services. It works. It is basically a tool that sits between an organization's on-premises infrastructure and a cloud provider's infrastructure. KSB solution helps to identify and evaluate all the cloud applications in use. It also provides a sensitive information. It can detect and block unusual account behavior activity in indicative of malicious activities. By 2020, 85% of large enterprises will use a, a KSB solution for the cloud services, which is up from 5% in 2015. Through 2020, Sorry for the interruption, but you have last two minutes. Please try to conclude your presentation. 95% oh, of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. So uh, this is our objective of my research paper. In our work, our goal-oriented security issues mind map uh, method is formulated for strengthening cloud security with cloud access security broker. For this, we have uh, I proposed a method which is capable of supporting some of the key uh, capabilities that organization look for in a cloud access security broker. The steps first we have to identify stakeholders for different enterprises. Identify prime object, objective of KSB, use KSB for placing the stakeholder into relevant colloquium. After that, we have to use end of graph formulation. Uh, with the end of graph formulation, we, uh, we use mind map to assign end of graph. Different types of security issues are identified by using the end of graph. This is our proposed methodology diagram. In our work, we have considered 15 stakeholders that are participating in cloud computing security process. Uh, and the name of these 15 stakeholders are uh, highlighting statistics, data load prevention, monitoring, secure, uh, secure channel, data encryption, transparent security, transparency, malware detection, access unique, negation, heterogeneity, login log, logging, auditing, uh, IT, security, infrastructure, policy based services. Uh, after that, we, these are the meaning of clouds uh, security uh, 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 <coughs> we cluster on the basis of cs1 cs2 cs3 cs1 uh, stand for cloud security one cloud security two three uh, we cluster in different different form if we want to further sorry this is actually uh, the cloud goal so i i took only one uh, cloud security and explore it by using the mind map mind map method what is actually the uh, key management tool these are the conclusion of each of us has been an ever uh, growing and flourishing in the cloud security uh, 
field. Security has been considered as a prime concern in this paper that should be addressed between the enterprise infrastructure and cloud service provider with the help of CASB. For this, we have demonstrated a method called Goal Oriented Security Issues Mindset Generation Method for the cloud, cloud computing security issues with CASB. For further exploration of node of and or graph, we attach mind map in the proposed method. These kind of critical studies are very helpful in de uh, decomposing decomposition and refinement of the nodes of and or graph in an organized way. In this with team that is key management for more decomposition and modification. This paper has also introduced the concept of CASB to classify the different stakeholders and place these stakeholders in an appropriate form so that stakeholders can uh, who have similar type of requirements can participate collaboratively in, enhance, in enhancement of security of cloud computing. Mm -hmm. uh, the future direction of the proposed method can be its application for constructing the end of graph of various uh, modules of an institute to strengthen the relevant analysis between numerous goal-oriented cloud computing method and to encompass the formulated method by using fuzzy logic and multi-criteria decision making method such as AHP, WCS and rough set theory. And, uh, and to formulate a hybrid cloud access security worker by using a well organized method for mining regular regularity element sets may be the future direction of the proposed method. These are the differences which I use in my paper. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, so basically, uh... I just have one question, like, uh, have you implemented uh, this method? Uh, not yet, you? not yet. I'm trying to implement this. And uh, uh, after that, I have to modify some paper, this paper and will try to send to uh, another SCI general. Okay. So, so uh, will you comment the implementation, uh, implementation is not yet completed. I'm working on it. Okay. So, uh, are you sure like uh, the comparative result analysis would be better? Like, uh, there would yes, be some yes, existing yes. method related to this, right? So, um, right, well, yes, how, yes. how are you going to um, comment that this method would be better than whatever the uh, previous methods which are uh, related to this particular? Uh, like, uh, in literature, I. I that? Yeah. LDG, I didn't find the mind map, mind map concept with cloud computing so that it will uh, enhance the security. I am working on it. AWS KMS I'm using for implementing this uh, method and uh, definitely it will uh, enhance the security. Ma am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, actually, uh, will you just uh, explain how this mind map method will uh, be used in the security? We can, uh, like first, uh, help if we want to analyze something uh, in a uh, well organized way, then we can use mind map so that we can uh, we can't skip any single point uh, for security for for losing the security so that mind map in uh, will provide the picturization or the organized way so that we can't skip any security issue okay 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 thank you uh, thank you thank you, you. Uh, ma'am yes ma yes yes you can stop now you said thank you okay, well, thank you the next uh, uh, presentation is an interactive tool for designing end to end workflow ravi kant by ravi kant Mr. Ravi Kant, are you there? Yeah. 
we are not unable to hear you mr ravi khan ma'am shall we wait for 1 to 2 minutes um yes ma'am so yes. Uh, yes go for the next presentation uh, take ravi khan the ravi khan after this one okay okay, okay. sure So next presentation is by Prachi Kadam Investigation of Methodology of Food Volume and Estimation and Data Set Yes hello ma'am uh, good afternoon are you able to hear me yes yes, yes. yes. you are able yeah okay i'll just share my screen Uh, should I start? Yes, you can start. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, all the panel members. Uh, so today I am going to present over here my study of uh, different uh, methodologies of food volume estimation and different data sets used in image-based dietary assessment. So this is my uh, this is the outline. These are the points that I am going to cover today. Uh, so uh, obesity has become a very big. Um, driving factor uh, for some serious and chronic diseases such as cardiovascular diseases diabetes and it has been marked as a major driving factor for some chro chronic diseases like cancers as well by who so uh, how how do we keep uh, obesity at bay or control obesity is with the help of different dietary assessment systems that are available right now due to due to digital uh, uh, boom there are different apps on mobiles as well as websites available to uh, you know maintain your dietary uh, pattern uh, of food intake on daily basis at itself there are several apps that are available online but uh, uh, they are divided into two parts there there is human intervention where uh, humans are supposed to, uh, we are supposed to enter manually the content that you have the food that you have intake part intake in a particular day now this could be highly inaccurate and it might not give you a proper pattern of your dietary intake so the solution to this is image based dietary assessment instead of uh, having uh, uh, the user to enter uh, or maintain a diary kind of a thing online in the app the user can take a pic of his meal and upload it on this app and the app itself is going to do the assessment of the uh, food item it will identify the food item it will find out the portion size and maintain the calorific count that is uh, in taken by the uh, user in the entire day this will reduce the amount of error that has that has been introduced due to manual entry so uh, the performance is going to uh, increase and the inaccuracies of entering the data entering the food intake record is going to reduce now what are the different pillars of image based dietary assessment first you need to take uh, you need to identify the food image then classify the food image segment the food image because there might be multiple multiple food items on the same plate find out or estimate the food volume of that single element and then find out collective uh, volume of uh, collective volume of the other food items as well and find the total calorific value of the dish itself so how how does image based food volume estimation work the measurement of the portion size of the food item on the plate is examined uh, accurately by different algorithms that are available now what happens is in the traditional methods the dietitians uh, they ask us to maintain a food diary so if we use image based food volume estimation it will obviously uh, reduce the human errors that are introduced and there will be less possibility of miscalculation of food volume estimation because once you estimate the food volume that is going to correlate to directly to the calorific value of that food and if the calorific value uh, is miscalculated then obviously the food intake of or the uh, the calorific calorific value that leads to obesity 
that relation you will not the dietitian will not be able to infer properly so it's very necessary that we remove these human errors in between so we are going to work only on the food images and directly uh, get a calorific value from the food images now there are different methods from study from the literature review we found out that there are five standard methods to estimate food volume so those are stereo based model based approach perspective transfer transformation approach depth camera approach and deep learning approach so i'll just walk you through these uh, different standard uh, possible methods and which is the uh, trending method uh, right now so in stereo based uh, approach it usually co converts the particular image into a 3d model reconstruction all of these this, the base of all of these approaches is geometric so a geometric calculation is done of the height the width and the depth of that food item on the plate in stereo based uh, approach uh, a 3d model is reconstructed from the 2d image that is given so this is the first method the mean error can go up to 28% so it is a, a it gives you max so it it also depends on the image type that has been given to you Rashi, sorry yes. for the interruption. Yeah, you yeah. have last one minute, please. Try to conclude your presentation. Okay, okay. Fine, fine. So basically, uh, all these methods that are available, they are uh, based on 3D reconstruction or 3D model of that particular um, food item on the plate from the image. The best possible uh, approach right now is deep learning. We found out that the mean error has reduced considerably due to a uh, deep learning approach and that's the reason why uh, uh, we have concluded we have found out for example this is the uh, this is the comparison of two papers uh, which are using particular data set and in which we can find out that the minimum uh, error that was found out to be was 1.62 percentage now um, the common flow of all these approaches is that uh, you are supposed to choose a device capture the image Uh, segment of food classify the food and find out what that food type is find out the food volume estimation and what is the portion size estimate the portion size different types of uh, portion size estimation was area volume or in terms of calories now there is a, a one particular uh, finding very important finding that uh, we came across is that all of the study is based on a data set now there is a problem in the data set in the sense that majority of the data set that that these people, uh, these authors have worked on they are, they have worked on uncooked items and uh, or they are using uh, typically raw or canned or uncooked food due to which and there is no standard benchmark data set available so that is one of the major problems and we are going to focus on that particular problem also uh, uh, a but a benchmark data set development is very very necessary and we are going to explore more in the deep learning techniques that are available and one more interesting finding is that uh, we could train our model with the help of various types of uh, containers in which the food is available so uh, can that be used to get better results that we are going to work on so like uh, train the model with the help of different types of plates and bowls so uh, so these are the two important findings from our study these are the references and yes that is it okay uh, prachi i must say you have carried out very nice literature survey on your topic thank you uh, uh, i just have uh, one uh, to two couple of question like uh, the first one is uh whatever the diet chart which we uh, are going to propose every, to everybody uh, there are certain physical characteristics also involved in that particular uh, estimation so my physics would be different than somebody else physics yes. so you must take some uh, inputs uh, along with this uh, correct correct the whatever the investigation which you are uh, doing like right. uh, ultimately the main aim of your project is uh, giving the proper diet uh, chart to the person okay what he should eat but uh, whatever the uh, images which you are processing along that i i 
feel ki you must take his physical attributes physical characteristics also that is one suggestion and uh, second one is like uh, how are you going like you are going to click the image of the food so estimating the uh, volume of that particular food based on image is a challenging uh, task so what algorithms which you find uh, in doing this particular task do you name some algorithms like during yes. your literature survey uh, how the volume estimation would be done based on the image right so a 3d model uh, 3d modeling is the best approach uh, that uh, we found out the results are very very good for that so that is one approach and in uh, deep learning r cnn gives you a very good uh, result so we haven't implemented these two on our data data set we are we are developing our own data set on indian food images so that is one thing that we are working on right now and uh, as you correctly said the first point that we need to take the physical attributes so we have on board a di- a nutritionist who gave us the same inputs the the basic thing is that according to your age your financial uh, position uh, uh, and your physique your your height and uh, or your bmi the metabolism rate is going to change or even on the basis of the medicines that you take so we are uh, consider yeah, even few points. people might suffer with sugar bp correct, uh, correct. Uh, their right. requirement would be different right right so medications are also going to affect the metabolism rate yes so surely from all these points the calorie counting the calorific values and uh, suggesting a diet chart or chart on the basis of the points that you correctly mentioned the other physical attributes we'll have to combine all these okay okay thank you prachi uh ma'am yes ma'am uh the next presentation shall we go for the next presentation yes 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 okay. so i'll just Ravikan. unshare yes yes ma'am. yes yes ma'am. Uh, is Ra- ravikant has joined shall we uh, consider his presentation yes ma'am we can but i have two ravikant so let me unmute them you please ha you please uh, hello yes ravikant you are audible please go ahead with your presentation yeah thank you ma'am uh, one second yes ma'am your screen is also visible yeah a very good afternoon to all um, my topic is interactive to interactive tool for designing an end to end secure protocols and currently working as a phd scholar in nid varangal so the as per for the presentation this is my present agenda, uh, agenda that i'll be first defining what is end to end security and current existing mechanisms to achieve end to end security and read a status quo model and a tool execution and its output so what is end to end security so by definition end to end security goes like a system in which every participant will have necessary and sufficient image and sufficient knowledge of every object in the system on a need to know basis so what are the current existing mechanisms to achieve an end to end security so currently we are using access control mechanisms and cryptography but the problem with access control mechanism is that it guarantees confidentiality but not on the integrity no guarantee on integrity of the data as well as cryptography provides guarantee on integrity but not on confidential data so despite adhering to these mechanisms some very well known protocols have been successfully compromised for example nidam shader protocol as a public key which, which was introduced in 1978 was successfully attacked by an attack called lovis attack in 1995 so similarly kerberos ssl uh, protocol have been successfully attacked so what could be the basic reason that's what the main uh, uh, research work has been started so we understood what are the main causes now what is the contribution we have made through this paper so we have developed an interactive tool that guides the protocol designer to identify potential securities at the design stage itself so how do we are how we are achieving it so information flow is uh, models are there for example in the literature which which controls the flow of the model uh, flow of the information in a system so 
we have picked a, a novel information flow model called reader status flow which is actually obtained by recasting a Dennis, uh, Dennings labeling information flow control model. So what is there in the RWFM? RWFM explicitly captures the readers and writers of a particular object and it makes the semantics of the labels very explicit and by immediately it will give an intuition of the object's position in the lattice flow, lattice information flow. So how do we, by implementation, how do we do it? So as defined earlier, it has a labeling structure, which is a triplet that is S, W and R, where S is the owner of the information and R represents the set of the subjects who, who can read the content of that object and write uh, as W re refers to how, who can influence that object. So for example, the Schroeder protocol is like A, B sends an object to B, A sends an object to B and B sends in reply to A and A response with some other object. So as per the labeling, if you see when A sends in a comma Mr. A, David, sir, sorry for the interruption, but you have last one minute, please conclude your presentation sometime. Yes, ma'am. So as per the lowest attack, the our tool actually specifies that the labeling is updated. So there is somebody else other than B and C so there are some extra persons who have influenced the object. So when a Lewis attack has been performed, subject B on receiving the message could immediately verify that B and C are not the only influences of the receiver object. So there is somebody else eavesdropping the communication. So in general, uh, this is the snapshot of the state of the object when some uh, action happens like A sends an object to B. And but the tool actually guarantees security by design. And currently it is in two modes, that file mode and uh, manual mode. So the what is there in the uh, output of the tool is for what is one is workflow file, that is the flow, protocol flow, and the labeling is uh, captured in IFT file. That's it. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so basically uh, you have uh, given the authentication and security by using reader and writer monitoring, right? Readers and writer monitoring. Am not only, uh, uh, yes ma'am, like not only the you, in a, in a way, yes. Yes ma'am. Uh -huh. Or uh, other than this, you have implemented anything related to the security. See, I assume authentication uh, checking is there and uh, with authentication checking, uh, you are giving the security also. Is there any, uh, some, someone else who does not have the authority but have done some writing tasks? Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, basically ma'am, uh, uh, we are actually looking not exactly the authentication purpose itself. It's mm -hmm. a more broader in, in the nature. Like uh, I will be knowing like who all have been influenced this object earlier we, before it has reached me. So mm -hmm. I could know that as per the protocol, this should not be happening. So mm -hmm. even if you say authentication or any other protocols, mm -hmm. we have this, if we have, if we put this labeling structure, both security and confidentiality is achieved. Mm -hmm. Achha, what would be the extra overhead requirement uh, in your case? Like uh, you are monitoring uh, reader and writer. So uh, memory wise and space wise, is there any uh, uh, re requirement which will be required for your approach? Uh, which will be the extra overhead uh, required in your proposed approach as compared uh, to the other existing methods. as per this as per the space i would say it would be very minimal but uh -huh. while a step execution is happening we are doing a lot of checks on the list so for example if a protocol is having n number of uh, objects which are being referred and influenced and read right so the set could be increased so at that time there could be a delay in validation alone, but the output will be a more, I think I can, um, the tool can actually balance that. Like we are providing more security, even though we are exceeding validation by 0 0.0 or 10% or 20%. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, have you done compare? You have implemented this tool, right? So have you yes, done any comparative analysis with the other yes, tools like? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, currently, we have ProVerify and uh, some other tools. I've uh, used with the ProVerify. Uh, to be honest, like uh, we have uh, verified compared with uh, ProVerify. So ProVerify is uh, not, uh, the mechanism of the tool is like we write a protocol and we fed it to the pro, uh, tool where a static analysis is happening. So the analysis or the verification validations are happening based on the static analysis, uh, static conditions. But here uh, we say that this is by design. So each okay. step is being scrutinized very well according to the RWFA model. Okay. So what is the aspect of your tool which makes it uh, interactive yes. tool? Like why you are saying it's an interactive tool? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the future work, basically it depends upon the future work and we are uh, doing as a plus one of this stage that we are developing an application development framework Mm -hmm. where the developer or the implementation, uh, the, the coder, the programmer could actually leave all these security aspects and develop his own module so that application framework integrated with our tool will give a, a complete end-to-end -end aspect. So there'll be an application GUI, itself. interactive yes. GUI will be provided by uh, you. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Like it... Uh, Current state of the current state of the project is we are providing it as a package. So okay. we move it as a package to an Eclipse, and mm -hmm. you design. We design based on the protocol. So okay. that's how it goes. Okay. Okay. Nice work, uh, Ravika. So. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Can we thank proceed you. with the next presentation? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so next presentation is by Rachna. Uh, deep learning for NLP. So, will you please give her rights? Yes, I already gave her rights. Okay, okay. Hello? Yes, yes, now you are audible. Please go ahead with your presentation and start your screen sharing. Just a moment. Is my screen is visible? Not yet. Yeah, it's now visible. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon all. My name is Rasina Patel. I'm, go I'm working as an assistant professor at Charusat University. Today I'm going to present a paper, Deep Learning for Natural Language Processing. I start with the outline of my presentation. Uh, introduction, I will cover introduction, component of NLP, deep learning models for NLP, applications of deep learning for NLP, conclusion and references. First, introduction, natural language processing is a subdomain of artificial intelligence. It provides various algorithms to make human and computer interact with each other. It takes text data as an input, convert it into the structured data, which is easy to understand and analyze. The various algorithm, uh, the various advanced natural language processing applications are spam mail detection, uh, meeting report analysis, auto question answering, machine translation, and many more. NLP can be further subdivided into the NLU and NLG, that is natural language understanding and natural language generation. Uh, NLP is a machine capability to read and understand the content produced by human. However, NLG is refers to as the machine's ability to make the content in either written or spoken form. Digital voice applications like Alexa and Series, Google Assistant uses both NLP and NLG to perform effectively over the time. NLG can be considered as a sub part of the NLP, but vice versa is not possible. Natural language generation happens when computer writes. The major applications areas of NLG are chatbot application, content creator, or report generator program. The natural language understanding, next is the natural language understanding is a specific type of NLP that covers the NLP's reading aspect. Uh, natural language understanding is the ability of machines to understand, understand the human language by breaking down human language into segments. Machines are able to comprehend online comments, perform language translation, detect emotions, and many more. 
then next is the deep learning is how deep learning is used in nlp so deep learning is an extension of machine learning and artificial intelligence intelligence that, that teaches computers to learn from experience the same as human do so deep learning performs a task uh, like uh, 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 what human is doing in modern uh, centuries several deep learning architectures with diverse learning capability are introduced to grow machines that can do the task similar like to the human even, even in some various domains it is performing it performs well than the human like self driving cars image processing natural language processing weather predictive forecasting and medical diagnosis in recent year the architectures and algorithms of deep learning have made remarkable progress in areas like language processing and image recognition in the beginning they were less impressive in their application to natural language processing but now have made substantial contributions and provide state of art results for specific common nlp task some of the issues where convolutional neural network uh, trends have outperform in part of speech taking name entity recognition rashna ma'am sorry yes. for the interruption but i can't see your screen i i just see in my screen uh, actually is, madam i am i'm on introduction screen oh for the last 2 minutes for your presentation okay so next is the component of nlp that is morphological and lexical analysis syntactic syntax analysis semantic analysis pragmatic analysis then now uh, so many in this paper we have uh, mainly focus on how deep learning algorithms are used for nlp task so first one is the convolution neural network for natural natural language processing so generally uh, cnn is used for image processing nowadays cnn is also used for nlp task so in a uh, image processing image will be uh, given as an input to the uh, cnn so here uh, instead of image we are going to give the uh, sentence or a document to the cnn and then cnn will perform the convolutional convolution on this input matrix then it will try to identify the features map from the uh, by performing the convolution then max pooling will be applied to select the select the maximum Uh, values from this given uh, generated feature maps and then they will we'll apply the softmax function in that last layer to classify the state uh, statement or a document or the image so in this case we are classifying the statements so generally at the last it will perform the binary classification so in this way convolution uh, cnn is work for the nlp next is the recurrent neural are uh, recurrent neural network rnn so uh, recurrent neural network is a variant of an artificial neural network that can work with sequence prediction problems in deep learning rnn can be processed the information in two directions it allows user uh, use it uh, it uses previous stage output to be used as an input to the current state so how uh, here uh, we can uh, one drawback of cnn is that it cannot uh, recognize the previously generated data but here in rnn we can do so so that is the advantage of rnn over cnn then mr rashna uh, no, sorry rashna patel yes I have last 30 seconds please try to conclude your presentation on time okay fine so another is the attention mechanism where attention is given by, uh, for performing the nlp task so that is another mechanism that we have used over here then the application so many applications are already available so i will just list out it so sentiment analysis is there text classification is there news text classification is there for doing such kind of application deep learning models are used that general models are used that is cnn lstm rnn so this is the applications or um, just a listed list of the applications then the last is the conclusion nlp makes the computer able to read real time data or listen from the audio source understand it and try to extract emotion feelings and meaning associated with so deep learning has emerged and 
effective computing parallelism that tries to solve many complex tasks of NLP effectively. The paper explained the different deep, uh, deep learning architecture that includes CNN, RNN, attention model in proof. These are the references. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Rachna ma'am, am I audible to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So I have just uh, one question. Like you have done a literature survey on deep learning for NLP. And yes. You say there are uh, basically uh, three deep learning models which are used for the NLP purpose. Yes. One is CNN, second one is RNN, and third one is attentive attention. Attention mechanism. Yes. So, so out of this three, uh, which you conclude? Okay, what, what you conclude? Which which one is better and why? Okay. Uh, actually, it is, madam, depends on the application. Suppose if I want to focus on some attention mechanism for some particular task, then I will go with the attention mechanism model. Will you, will uh, you please give some example, like uh, for what kind of application attention will be uh, better? Uh, for example, suppose... Uh, I'll, just a minute. See, suppose if I want to do the event sentence detection, so for that, suppose uh, from uh, document, if I upload my document and if I want to uh, detect the event from that uh, document, then I can, I, I have to give focus on some uh, word. I, if I go give the, if I give attention on some particular words, then it will give, uh, it will search on that particular words only so that we can say we have given more attention on a particular task which we want to perform. So such kind of application we can consider that is if I want to give more focus or if I want to give more attention, then we can go with the attention model. Suppose if I want to perform a so normal uh, classification task, if I want to generalize the, uh, if I want to bifurcate the statements, if I want to identify the emotions, then I can go for the CNN. E and RNN is used for if I want to predict something based on previously out previous produced output, then I can go with the RNN. So RNN is recursive, so it is using the previously generated output in a current uh, identification or detection problem. So RNN is used in such kind of situation. Okay. Uh, text NLP and speech NLP analysis, there is a difference in that. So, yes. Uh, yes. Which which you find more challenging, uh, text natural language processing or speech natural language processing using deep learning? Uh, actually, madam, uh, in both the cases, I can say uh, both is having its own uh, problems. But uh, if I talk about the speech, so we can say suppose in a speech, suppose if I say hello. So my tone is different and some, for example, some Kathiawadi person is there. So he is speaking something different. So in that case, speech analysis is difficult to analyze the particular word or some pronunciation. So sometimes in that case, we can say speech uh, or a speech or audio is difficult. Okay. Or in some do, you find, do you find any limitation of deep learning uh, for NLP? NLP uh, in NLP domain when I am using deep learning, do you find uh, any drawback of using deep learning during your literature survey? Uh, actually, sir, madam, actually I was uh, do doing this for the first time, so I just tried to identify the uh, how we can use this deep learning in this process. Because if you wanted to use deep learning, uh, yes, yes. you need to use a very high performance. Uh, uh, yes, computer yes. because text and speech data set uh, deep learning's major uh, requirement is it should it, it works better on the huge data set yes and, uh, and act, uh, performing operations on that huge data set require a very high power uh, high performance computer yes yes, yes. that is the major uh, requirement of the deep learning for the nlp kind of problem yes, yes okay ma'am uh, thank you uh, good literature survey uh, Thank you so much. Uh, ma'am, uh, shall we proceed for the next and the last presentation? Yes, ma'am. Oh, so it's uh, learning analytics, a literature review and its challenges by Nisha, ma'am. Uh. 
hello good afternoon yes good afternoon nisha madam please go ahead uh, with your presentation okay ma'am uh, uh, my screen is visible yes 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 okay so my name is nisha and i am uh, pursuing phd from department of computer science university of delhi and today i am going to uh, present uh, a paper on uh, learning analytics a literature review and its challenges and my co-authors and they are my guide also uh, uh, one is professor sunil kumar matu and second is dr arshna singhal so uh, so uh, firstly i want to tell you about what is learning analytics and why we uh, why we perform analysis why we use learning analytics basically nowadays uh, uh, the educational institutes have the uh, large variety of digital information about the learners like their performance record their feedback records uh, their uh, online resources and uh, their attendance record their course allocation course material records so with the help of this learning analytics we can analyze that educational data and we can develop a predictive model which can uh, which can uh, which can predict the future uh, aspects of the future of the student on the basis of the past collected data of the student so by this for example suppose we have one student who is performing good in the maths course so in the undergraduate course then we can tell him that he can pursue the uh, masters in the mathematical course and also we can identify the at risk students and we can provide the on time feedback to the to those students and we can uh, we can increase the success rate of the student and we can ma minimize the failure rate of the student so that is why we use the learning analytics the main aim is to is to find out the at risk student and we can improve we can provide the feedback to those students and they can improve on time and this will also provide the benefit to the other stakeholders like the teachers like the researchers teachers can also improve their learning practices and decision making uh, uh, and effective organization they can also uh, organize their uh, work also so this is beneficial for all the stakeholders but uh, you uh, when you perform the analysis on that data you have to share that data to the third party and uh, when you share that data with the data analyst after sharing the data you do not have any control over the data and the data analyst can perform anything and, and can do anything with that data so we have to uh, provide the privacy to the data uh, of the individuals whose data is within uh, we, which we are using for the analysis purpose so before sharing we have to apply some privacy uh, algorithms on that data so basically we have some actors involved like the data subject whose data uh, we are going to use for the analysis purpose so the main entities are the students or the learners and data owner is the entity who basically collects the data and store the data so uh, for example the educational institutes they have the data of the students and and the learners and uh, third is the data analyst which analyze the data so before giving that data to the data analyst we have to perform some privacy algorithm we have to apply some privacy algorithm on that data so that uh, that we can ensure that that, uh, uh, that data is secure and these are the some attributes uh, the information which we store in, into the database uh, that basically categorize into different attributes like the explicit identi identifiers are the unique attribute for example the roll number ids of the student quasi identifier these are the linking attributes like the course books of the student sensitive attributes are these information which we want to uh, secure from uh, the third party Uh, for example the grades the marks uh, uh, of the student and auxiliary information is the information which uh, does not fit into the above attributes and we can put that information into the uh, into this uh, uh, particular category for example the course objectives so uh, this is basically the uh, schema of the student data records like how we can store the data uh, like uh, we can store the student information course information and in every uh, relation we can divide the attributes in the in these categories and uh, this is the basically system architecture uh, we in this paper we uh, basically you uh, describe the four techniques k anonymization l diversity uh, yes 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 sir last 30 seconds please try to 40 continue. seconds last okay <laughs> yes ma'am yes uh, so <laughs> we have uh, these four techniques and uh, 
in this paper uh, so basically with the help of this k anonymization and l diversity we anonymize the data and we give the published data to the uh, data analyst and we apply these algorithms and we give the generalized data to the uh, data analyst and in uh, in statistical disclosure control basically there is an interface uh, by which the data analyst can access that data and we introduce the noise into the result of that data and uh, that will provide the security to that data and that will give the and then we will uh, provide that data to the data analyst and the last is the uh, uh, and the last is the t closeness in t closeness uh, basically uh, Uh, we have uh, we just check that in every equivalence class the distribution of sensitive attribute should be close to the distribution attribute in the overall table so if we if in every equivalence class the uh, distribution is less than the th uh, uh, t value threshold then we can say that that uh, okay this table has a t closeness so basically we have these four algorithms and we uh, we differentiate also these algorithm on the basis of the attacks which they can uh, by which they can secure the data which they uh, which they can handle and the data quality of the data and uh, yes on the basis of the these things we get uh, we differentiate these algorithms and uh, the another important thing is the utility of data when you provide pri privacy to the data that time you generalize the data so uh, it is not useful when you give the random data at random data to the analyst because analyst analyst also cannot find out any useful information from that data so we have to keep uh, maintain the balance between the privacy and utility of the data uh, so this is uh, i have uh, the some analysis on that data basically uh, i'll show you the results so basically this is the k anonymization and l diversity result uh, is basically shows that as you are increasing the parameter of uh, privacy your error rate is incre uh, increasing error is basically uh, uh, showing the privacy if you uh, so uh, uh, if the error is increasing that means your data is more secure so uh, this basically showing that as you are increasing the value of k and l your error is also increasing so lastly uh, uh, every technique has some advantages and disadvantages we cannot say that and there is no technique single technique which can apply the uh, which can provide the privacy to data so in future we can say that the uh, this problem can be addressed using the hybrid technique by combining the best features of the existing techniques so uh, these are the references and thank you okay uh ashwini uh, can we Can yes. view on it. Yes, 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 ma'am. Uh, basically, uh, Nisha, ma'am, I guess like uh, uh, based on the learner's attributes, uh, your system is going to predict which is the appropriate uh, future plan for his career, like right? Yes, we can also do that, and we can also uh, identify the students who are not participating, who are not involved in any activity, and who need. uh more guidance and we can identify those students and we can provide if we can provide them the on time feedback then they can improve and okay. they can uh, and by this they, we can uh, increase the success rate and the main aim is to reduce the failure rate of the students okay so uh, yes basically uh, i think marks is not only the criteria with which no, we no, can no no marks is not only the criteria so, the... so will you please tell me the attributes or features which will be used in your uh, analytic uh, part uh, like just... uh, uh, for example if uh, if we give some assignment to any student and if we can track the online activity of that student and if we also have the attendance record of the student ki whether a uh, student is attending the classes or not attending the classes and submitting the assignments or not so on the basis of that we can find out the involvement rate of that student and how uh, if we can track his online activities to so which websites he is visiting and uh, online resources using the student is using so on the basis of that also we can identify ki Uh, which student is invo uh, involved in the in doing the assignment and who is not doing that, and uh, who need the basically the main guidance. So these are also the criteria: the attendance and the online resources and the yes, uh, these can be the criteria. Okay, the extracurricular activities which will be carried uh, out. Yes, yes, yes. And so 
also find uh, gives the personality yes, aspect sir. whether yes, that student is having leadership quality or not how is his yes, personality okay. and on that yes. basis also you can understand mm-hmm. that particular student yes so it could be recommended like the features which you are considering it should not be yes, just sir. based on whatever the academic uh, mm-hmm. aspects which are there mm-hmm. but along with that other aspects uh, need to be considered okay so that yes, is ma'am, ma'am. Uh, this is a good feedback i'll i'll uh, surely uh, use yes. your feedback and incorporate it and uh, like mm-hmm. uh, the literature survey which you carried out in mm-hmm. that you are saying uh, uh, if you wanted to make it more secured uh, mm-hmm. that case the error rate is get increased so will you mm-hmm. please uh, make focus on this particular statement like because uh, uh, actually uh, ma'am when you apply the uh, uh, privacy basically what we are doing we are generalizing that data with the help of uh, i mean like you have some specific values we convert that value into the generalized value like we have k anonymization the definition is says that that each record should be indifferent from at least k minus 1 records with respect to the cosi identifiers that means uh, like uh, just one second ha huh. like in this uh, we have uh, here the k is 2 that means in every equivalence class we have two entities so suppose we have one student we know that she is uh, she is studying uh, english and we want to extract the grade of that student so from the private data set we can directly fetch that uh, this is the student he is she is uh, studying matlab there is uh, it, this is the unique entity corresponding to the detail of that student so we can directly find out the value but in this because we apply the two anonymization here and now we have two tuples which are which is corresponding to the same information so uh, so in this we have two uh, values of grades so here the probability is half of, of extracting the information of that student so that means we are we are just uh, uh, converting the specific value into the more generalized value error means if you are applying some queries on the database on the original database and on the anonymized database if you are getting the wrong results or the errors in the result that means your data is more secure now you are not going to getting the specific entity of that particular student or that particular learner on the basis of the uh, background information mm-hmm. okay okay uh... thank you uh, thank you nisha uh, okay. ma'am thank you uh, i guess all presentations yes, are over now. all presentations okay. are over now i just uh, wanted to make few comments uh, overall for the whole presentation all presentations were nicely uh, presented and uh, uh, literature survey which was carried out that was also excellent and uh, the contributions which were presented that are also um, good uh, contributions and uh, good implementations were presented so thank you ma'am uh, this was a very uh, nice session yes, and yes. i want to thank you uh, you and your organizing committee for uh, giving me an opportunity to hear yes. uh, this if the participants have any query or question you can directly ask to the host or coach uh, the chat forum is open for all uh, i sincerely thank our researcher for their excellent presentation in this session and all our participants for being a part of this international conference i hope this session was informative and knowledgeful as well all the particip- uh, all the presenters would be getting their digital certificate payment receipt thank you letter through mail within two working days further all the papers have already forwarded to the springer for publication process the publication will be live uh, within four to five months kindly cooperate with the team ict cs during this tenure i also thank our, our session chair ashwini madam thank you ma'am thank you dr ashwini sapkal for ta- chairing this session thank you ma'am for your valuable thank presence thank you ma'am thank you Bef- ma'am this is for you madam thank you for your presence ma'am this is for thank you, you madam thank you thank you ma'am <laughs> dear all i kindly request you to all of you to open your camera for the glimpse yes by the time kushal if possible 
can you please share the online certificate for the ma'am yes ma'am i yes ma'am yeah. i will it is my humble request to all of you please turn on your camera so we can take quick snapshot for the memory ict cs 2020 Yes, this is the new normal time. Hope oh, we can meet soon in twenty two zero twenty one in personal. Okay. May I leave, ma'am? Now? Uh, no, not now. please uh, give me a big <laughs> smile of all of you <laughs> just the last few, few few seconds man sorry okay thank you thank you everyone stay safe stay, stay healthy take precautions take care of yourself and your loved ones stay safe thank you thank you ma'am yeah. thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir